Save 10% with my code BOBBY10 on raw, organic, grass-fed and grass-finished freeze-dried organ meats from Grassland Nutrition. Link in the description box. Alright guys, welcome back to the channel. If you're new, my name is Bobby. Guys, yes, we are back in the kitchen again. This time it's a different kitchen. I'm traveling yet again. I left Europe. I'm going to tell you all about it in my upcoming live stream. Anyways, today we're going to react to many prophets, one message yet again, and this time with the linguistic miracle of the Quran. As I said multiple times before, I was amazed with the structure of the Quran and I was amazed with the writing style. Nevertheless, I just read a translation, so to speak, from Arabic into English. Unfortunately, I'm not an Arabic speaker and therefore I cannot appreciate the full beauty of the Quran. This is why this video here is of particular interest to me personally, because it shall explain what what the linguistic miracle of the Quran truly is. Let's have a look. The Quran is a literary masterpiece that has fascinated mankind since its initial revelation over 1,400 years ago. A unique quality of the Quran is the linguistic gems that are hidden within the surface level meaning of the text, giving it an unparalleled depth. While ordinary books grow stale over time, when it comes to the Qur'an, the more one studies it, the more of these linguistic gems one discovers, which serves to increase its literary merit. <laughs> the famous Qur'anic exegete Ibn Kathir wrote, Whoever reads through the Qur'an will realize that it contains various levels of superiority through both the apparent and hidden meanings that it mentions. In this video, we will look at examples of linguistic gems which will help non-Arabic speakers to appreciate the Qur'an's literary magnificence. Absolutely perfect. This is exactly what I was looking for. Let's continue. Chapter 4 of the Qur'an asks the reader to reflect on its perfection. Do they not consider the Qur'an with care? Had it been from other than Allah, they would surely have found therein many contradictions. The argument being put forward here is that had the Qur'an been from other than Allah, then it would contain many contradictions as mistakes and errors are the hallmark of fallible human works. This is the apparent and intended meaning of the verse. To play devil's advocate yet again here, Bart D. Ehrman, who is an American scholar, said the contradiction part doesn't necessarily prove that it's from God or that it isn't from God. Because if you look at a phone book, for example, a phone book doesn't have contradictions, but that doesn't mean that therefore it comes from God. This is, of course, a very cheeky remark, because if you're talking about a phone book, you simply list names with numbers. Therefore, there is really no possibility for it to have contradictions in the first place. Nevertheless, I mention this to stay critical of YouTube videos. However, what if the reader chooses to be devilish and play games with the Quran by interpreting it in a more abstract sense, such as numerically? For example, what if one was to read through the entire Quran cover to cover and count how many times the word contradictions is written? Okay. The intention here is that if there is more than one occurrence, then the Qur'an will have disproven itself, because it states that false divine books contain many occurrences of the word contradictions. Now, the Arabic language is based on a triliteral root system, where words can be reduced. I don't find that a strong argument to begin with, but okay, let's entertain it. Juiced to a basic three-letter consonantal form, with all the words that derive from that root sharing the same core meaning. The word contradictions that we are dealing with here has the three letter root kha, la, fa. Now if you were to undertake this counting exercise, then you will find that words with the root kha, la, fa appear over a hundred times in numerous different forms throughout the Quran. But the word okay. contradictions in this specific plural form, the Arabic ikhtilafan, occurs exactly once in the very verse that we are analyzing. So a person can be as devilish as they like when interpreting this verse. Whether you choose to take it literally or more abstractly, the Qur'an's claim that it is from the divine still holds true. Fair enough. 36 of the Qur'an speaks of the heavenly bodies. It is not allowable for the sun to reach the moon, nor does the night overtake the day, but each, in an orbit, is swimming. 
Here, the heavenly bodies are said to be swimming in orbits, which is an accurate description of our cosmos. The phrase each in an orbit is the Arabic kullun fi falak. Let's take a closer look at the arrangement of the Arabic letters. The first and last letter is kaf. The second and second to last letter is lam. And the third and third to last letter is fa. The letters actually mirror one another and are swimming around the letter ya in the middle. This letter happens to be the first letter of the word used for swimming in this very verse, yasbahun. We can see that the arrangement of the letters mimics the behavior of the orbiting heavenly bodies being spoken of in this very verse. Chapter 90 of the Quran reminds man of his creation. Have we not made for him two eyes and a tongue and two lips and have shown him the two ways? If we analyze the Arabic letters in these verses, we find that there- What does that exactly mean? If somebody knows, please let me know in the comments section and have shown him the two ways. Which two ways are we speaking of? Are exactly two occurrences of the letter Ain. The name of this letter is the same Arabic word for I. So these verses have been created with two eyes, just like Allah says he created man with two eyes. Okay. Chapter three of the Quran mentions the following about Adam and Jesus. Indeed, the example of Jesus to Allah is like that of Adam. He created him from dust. Then he said to him, be, and he was. Mm -hmm. Here we are informed that Adam and Jesus are like one another in terms of their origin. For they both had miraculous births without the involvement of a man. Right. Now what's amazing is that if one counts... Then and if that wasn't amazing enough, I really don't understand why we as Christians lift Jesus up to God status. It is absolutely miraculous how Jesus came to be, how Adam came to be. There's such an exalted status to be created with, but why can't we understand that he was created? It's really mind-boggling to me. I never thought of Jesus as God, as the creator, because everything that that is already a mental image. Everything that we can understand, everything that we can imagine, everything that we can fully relate to cannot be God. Number of occurrences of the words Adam and Jesus throughout the Quran, you will find that they are both mentioned exactly 25 times in total. Oh, Moreover, okay. up to the point of this verse itself, they have both been mentioned seven times so far. We can see that the likeness of Adam and Jesus goes beyond just their origin and even holds true numerically in the mention of their names. Chapter 1 That is absolutely amazing, I didn't know it. 109 of the Quran commands Muslims to reject idolatry. Here the Quran uses an elongated vowel known as a med when it refers to Allah as what? Ma and the irregular vowel when referring to the idols as what? Ma this subtle use of long vowels, while simple, is actually quite powerful when we reflect on it. What I find very, very powerful is aside from the linguistic miracle, simply the text itself. Let's read this in English together. Say, O oh disbelievers, I do not worship what you worship, nor are you worshippers of what I worship, nor will I be a worshipper of what you worship, nor will you be worshippers of what I worship. For you is your religion, and for me is my religion. This is so powerful and so beautiful, man. When I read this, it put everything into perspective. And at the same time, as I mentioned previously, it made me really wonder about the Muslims that I met. I hope I pronounced Muslims right this time. Because the people I talked to didn't present Islam to me in this fashion. They didn't tell me, hey, you worship what you worship, I worship what I worship. This is so humbling, but at the same time, it makes you understand that as a true believer, you worship the one true God. And what the disbelievers do, that is their business. Let them worship what they worship. You, on the other hand, know exactly that you cannot worship anything else but the one God. This is absolutely amazing, man. Idols as what? Ma this subtle use of long vowels, while simple, is actually quite powerful when we reflect on it. 
It is a great use of rhetoric which distinguishes and elevates Allah, indicating that he is different to and far above what the Arab pagans worshipped. Moreover, by distinct Right, because he is not even a what. He transcends this question. Wishing Allah from the idols in this way, it reinforces the central theme of the chapter, which is the refusal of the Muslims to accept the pagan Arab proposal to worship their false gods, because right. they are not equal to Allah, not even at a basic linguistic level. Let's compare this with the New Testament. You okay. Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. Notice mm. how the author of the New Testament refers to all of the deities as what? In Greek, hos, with mm -hmm. zero distinction between the God of Israel and the false gods of the pagan Samaritans. Mm. While this is not necessarily an issue in and of itself, it does go to show that the New Testament does not have the same linguistic depth as the Quran when it comes to distinguishing the one true God from false gods. Fair enough. Two of the Quran it's a little detail, but it's an important one. Change the change in direction of the daily prayers for Muslims. We have made you believers a middle nation so that you may bear witness to the truth before others. We only made the direction the one you used to face in order to distinguish those who follow the messenger from those who turn on their heels. The direction right. of the daily prayers changed from Jerusalem to Mecca, which represented an important turning point for the believers. Now this chapter is the longest in the Quran, consisting of a total of 286 verses, and we find the mention of this important turning point in exactly the middle of the chapter, the 143rd verse. Moreover, this verse even contains the word middle. Chapter 5 of the Quran mentions the qualities of believers. O oh Muslims, your friends are Allah, His Messenger and the believers, those who establish regular prayers and regular charity, and they bow down humbly. And this is an absolutely beautiful verse as well because it establishes the friendship with God, a very, very special relationship to God that I personally didn't know about before reading the Quran. When I started researching Islam, I was really surprised to find that Muslims can be friends with God. Before that, I simply thought it is a slave to master relationship and that's about it. Just a vicious king that rules his slaves. And of course, there is merit and truth to that as well. But I find it very important to remind ourselves that God is our friend and the devil is our enemy. At the time this verse was revealed, there were hypocrites. Those who professed to be Muslim publicly were inwardly were disbelievers, living mm -hmm. amongst the ranks of the true Muslim believers. It was very difficult to distinguish the hypocrites from the true believers based on outward appearance and actions, as they prayed and performed other acts of worship publicly just like the true believers. Sure. Note the order of the following statement as we find it within the verse. The believers are those who establish regular prayers and regular charity. Now it could have been written the other way around. Those who establish regular prayers and regular charity are the believers. At a glance, these two statements seem to convey exactly the same meaning. However, had it been written with a different order, then the implication would be that everyone who prays and gives charity are true believers, which would include even the hypocrites, because they prayed and gave charity, just like the Muslims. To okay. put it simply, every true believer prays and gives charity, <clears throat> but not everyone who prays and is charitable is necessarily a true believer. Fair they enough. Can see that they can simply go through the emotions and pretend. Of course, especially if you look at Islam as a societal construct. In that societal construct, people could hide behind being a Muslim, but in reality being disbelievers. Allah chose the perfect order for the words within the verse. The true believers are those that pray and give charity. Chapter 61 of the Quran quotes the speech of Moses and Jesus. And mention, O Muhammad, when Moses said to his people, O oh my people, why do you harm me while you certainly know that I am the messenger of God to you? And mention when Jesus, the son of Mary, said, O oh, children of Israel, indeed I am the messenger of God to you. In mm. the Quranic narrative, most messengers are sent to their own people. It is therefore typical for the messengers to address their audiences using language such as O oh, my people or O oh, my nation. Here we can see that Moses pleads with the Israelites by saying, O oh my people. He uses this identical language in many other verses, as do most other messengers in the Quran. It is curious then that in the very next verse, 
Jesus addresses the Israelites differently using the statement, O children of Israel. We can see that unlike Moses, Jesus does not address the Israelites as my people, no, right. even though he is also an Israelite prophet. Now in Sem But could that mean that Jesus didn't just come for the Israelites? Semitic tradition, one's tribal affiliation is paternal. It is based on one's lineage through the Father. In light of the fact that Jesus was miraculously born to the Virgin Mary and therefore did not have any actual lineage on his father's side, it would have been wrong for the Quran to have Jesus link himself genealogically to the Israelites as a group in a similar manner to Moses. We can see that the Quran's usage of language is extremely precise because it has Jesus address the Israelites in a manner that distances himself from them genealogically and therefore respects the virgin birth narrative. Sure, it respects the virgin birth narrative, but moreover, yet again, he is born miraculously and therefore he doesn't have the genealogy of the Israelites. And therefore, my honest question, yet again, let me know in the comment section, would be, is Jesus not sent for the whole world and not only for Israel? Chapter 19 of the Quran. It surely makes him special. Speech of Jesus. He, Allah, has made me blessed wherever I am, and he has enjoined upon me prayer and almsgiving as long as I live. The context of this verse is a nativity narrative. It is the story of Jesus miraculously speaking from the cradle in order to support his mother Mary's incredible claim to have conceived him as a virgin. The word translated here as enjoined is the Arabic verb awsaw. Now this is kind of unusual as when the Quran mentions moral, spiritual, or religious instruction, it typically uses a different form of the verb, wasa. The difference between the two verbal forms is that osa relates to matters that need to be stipulated a single time, such as when dividing inheritance. Okay. Whereas wasa relates to matters that require frequent reiteration, such as teaching. This All is right. the only instance in the entire Quran in which this form of the verb is used in reference to religious counsel. So why does the Quran break the pattern here with the speech of Jesus? Well, the other verbal form would have been less appropriate as it relates to matters that require frequent reiteration. And since Jesus was barely a day old when he was speaking from the cradle, this means that not enough time had passed yet for him to have been repeatedly given the command by Allah. The Quran makes use of a So you didn't have to learn. As onomatopoeia. Onomatopoeia is when a word phonetically resembles the sound that it describes. For example, the word boom sounds like an explosion, and right. the word buzz sounds like a fly. Here are some examples in the Quran. Chapter 114 consists of a supplication to seek God's protection from evil. Say, I seek refuge in the Lord of mankind, the sovereign of mankind, the God of mankind from the evil of the retreating whisperer, who whispers evil into the breasts of mankind, from among the jinn of mankind. The word whispers is the Arabic yuas wisu. Notice how it sounds like someone whispering. Moreover, the mm. word's composition tells us something about these whispering devils from among the jinn. It contains repetitive letters, waswas, -was, which alludes to the fact that these jinn target mankind repeatedly. The next example is from chapter 8. I would say if we believe in jinns, they would probably target us every single day. Which mentions the sounding of the trumpet that heralds the world's end. But when there comes the deafening blast, on the day a man will flee from his brother, and his mother and his father, and his wife and his children. Every man of that day will have concern enough to make him heedless of others. The words deafening blast is the Arabic asokha. When reciting this word, the vowel is supposed to be stretched for six seconds as follows. Wow. Which gives the impression of a trumpet being sounded. The word also contains the letters sword and kha, which are harsh sounding, and therefore perfectly in line with the terror that the verse conveys of that momentous event. The next example is from chapter 100, which vividly describes horses charging into battle by the steeds that run with panting breath and strike sparks of fire. The word panting is the Arabic dobahan, which contains the letters dod and ba in close proximity. The word strike is the Arabic qodahan, which contains the letters qaf and dal in close proximity. Mm -hmm. This arrangement of letters creates the echoey rebounding sounds qoda and doba, which is similar to galloping horses. 
From these examples, we can see that the Qur'an uses onomatopoeia to its advantage, almost as oral special effects, to really captivate the listener. Makes sense. Would be absolutely beautiful to understand Arabic and to actually appreciate this. It was originally revealed in the Arabic language. However, the Qur'an also engages with foreign languages such as Hebrew. Here are some examples. Chapter 2 recounts an incident with the Israelites. And recall when we took your covenant and raised over you the mount, saying, Take what we have given you with determination and listen. They said instead, We hear and disobey. And <laughs> their hearts absorbed the worship of the calf because of their disbelief. The golden the calf. The children of Israel were very rebellious towards God, with the golden calf incident epitomizing their disobedience. Quranic commentators yeah. note that their statement, We hear and disobey, was not literally vocalized by the Israelites but rather is symbolic of their disobedient actions. It sure. Reflected this very attitude yeah, they surely didn't say we hear and disobey, but rather they simply worship this golden calf in their delusion. It's absolutely mind-blowing to look into those times and see that those people truly worshipped a golden statue of a calf that they themselves built. So you as a creation are building God. Hearing and disobeying. Yeah. This happens to be a brilliant play on words from the Old Testament book of Deuteronomy. Go near and listen to all that the Lord our God says. Then tell us whatever the Lord our God tells you. We will listen and obey. Ah, In the Old Testament, flipped. the Israelites say, we listen and obey, mm -hmm. which is shamatnu wa asinu in Hebrew. The Quran seems to mirror this and turns the statement on its head mm -hmm. with its use of the very similar sounding Arabic words, Samitna wa alsayna or we hear and disobey. Mm -hmm. The next example is from chapter 11, which mentions some angels bringing good news to Abraham. This is actually very funny because it's like a diss. The Quran flips the statement on its head and makes the supposed believers disbelievers. Did our messengers come to Abraham with good tidings? They said, peace. He said, peace. And his wife was standing and she smiled. Then we gave her good tidings of Isaac. And after Isaac, Jacob. The name Isaac in Hebrew is Yitzhak, which means mm. one who laughs. So Abraham's wife laughed and she was blessed with a son whose name carries the meaning of laughing. We are mm. also Didn't informed that. that after Isaac will come Jacob, which is the Hebrew Yaakov, meaning to follow. Note how the verse places the name Jacob after Isaac. So Jacob is literally following on from Isaac in a textual right. sense, just like the meaning of Jacob's name suggests. Interesting. The next example is from chapter 19 which mentions Prophet Zachariah receiving glad tidings of a child. O Zachariah, indeed we give you good tidings of a boy whose name will be Yahya. He said, My Lord, how will I have a boy when my wife has been barren and I have reached extreme old age? The Quran states that Prophet Zachariah was given the good news of a child called Yahya. This baby was a miracle, as Zachariah's wife was no longer of a childbearing age. Christian apologists attack the Qur'an on this point, arguing that the biblical name of the son of Zechariah was the Hebrew Yohanan, and not Yahya, as the Qur'an incorrectly states. Alright, the same could be said about Jesus, of course, because in the Qur'an he is named Isa and not Yeshua. Exposes ignorance on the part of such Christian apologists who are unaware of the nuance at play here. The Arabic word Yahya comes from the root Haya, which means life. We can see that very subtly the Qur'an is alluding to the fact that it is only God who can miraculously bring about life from a barren woman. Now there are those who will argue that while the meaning of the name Yahya is contextually relevant within the Qur'an, it is still incorrect from a biblical perspective and shows that the author sure. of the Qur'an was ignorant of the actual name Yohanan. Consider then the fact that the Qur'an directly alludes to the Hebrew name in the following related verses. God said, O Yahya, take the scripture with determination. And we gave him judgment while yet a boy, and affection from us, and purity, and he was fearing of God. Note that the word used to describe Yahya here, affection, is the Arabic Hanan, which is very similar to the Hebrew Yohanan. So contrary to Christian apologist claims, we can see that the author of the Quran was well aware of the original name and chose to allude to it with some clever wordplay on the Hebrew. 
Now it's important to note that while the classic I'm not 100%ly convinced. took considerable time and effort to analyze the language and rhetoric of the Quran, none of their commentaries mention any of these examples of wordplay with the Hebrew language. So such knowledge was obviously not common at the time, which makes the Quran's insight into Hebrew all the more remarkable. In conclusion, this video has analyzed a handful of examples of what makes the Quran a literary masterpiece. The Quran is in fact full of such linguistic gems which permeate its every page. Let's consider the question of whether Muhammad, peace be upon him, could have been the Quran's author. His own wife Aisha and close companions informed us that he was a poor poet on a personal level. Aisha was asked, did the Prophet use to relate anything from poetry? She said, It was a most detestable thing to him, except that at times he used to relate a verse from the person of Benu Qais, and he unknowingly jumbled up the words. Abu Bakr told him it was not like that. So the Prophet said, By God, I am not a poet, and neither is it appropriate for me. When we also take into consideration that he could not read or write, then it is impossible to accept the proposition that he authored the Qur'an, the most important and profound work in the entire history of Arabic literature. There are different claims when it comes down to Muhammad's supposed illiteracy. Some people claim, yes, he was illiterate, he is the illiterate prophet. Others, on the other hand, say that he was literate indeed, that he was schooled in writing and reading. And this comes from critiques of Islam, but from Muslims as well. I heard Muslims talk about this and say that the statements about illiteracy are essentially wrong. I have to read much more about this, I have to do more research. Yet again, if you know more about it, let me know in the comment section. Who then could have been its author? When we appreciate the poetic landscape of 7th century Arabia, it becomes clear that its origin cannot be a human being. To the master poets of Arabia, the choice of words used in a poem was an extremely important part of determining its quality. Hence, literary critics would pay very close attention to the word choice when scrutinizing a composition. Sure, sure. Kitab al aghani is a famous encyclopedic collection of Arabic literature. It contains a story about the renowned poet Hassan ibn Thabit. In the market town of Ukaz, a center of poetic readings and competitions, Hassan ibn Thabit read out the following verses in praise of the heroism of his own tribe. لنا الجفنات الغرة يلمعنا بالدها وأسيافنا يقترنا من نجدة دما Ours are the balls of white twinkling in the forenoon and our swords drip with blood on account of our bravery. These verses employ one of the typical rhyme schemes of classical Arabic poetry and use vivid imagery to glorify the tribe. The literary critic and Nabi Yes, this is something that we have to keep in mind as well. Back in the day, war was something noble. To be a warrior was seen as something absolutely beautiful, absolutely good, of course. And this is why when we see modern day critique of Islam speak about, oh, Muhammad went to war. This comes, of course, from a very liberalized, progressive perspective where war is something evil and therefore it cannot be from God. Therefore, it cannot be good because war bad. One of the most revered Arab poets of the late pre-Islamic times was unimpressed and had this to say about the verses. He said Jafanat, but that is only a few balls. Jifan would have indicated a multitude of balls, and the Arabs boast by what is many and not what is few. Mm -hmm. He said al ghurra but that is used to refer to a speck of white. Al-Bayad would have signified whiteness, which is more extensive and total. He said Yalmatna, they twinkle, but Yashrukna, they give off light, would have been more intense in meaning. He said, okay. Bid duha, in the forenoon, but everything twinkles in the forenoon. It would have been better to say, Bid duja, in the night. He said, Asyaf, but that means only a few swords, whereas Suyuf would have indicated many swords. He said, Yakturna, they drip with blood, but Yadrina, they flow, would have been more impressive. He said, Dama, which indicates less blood, whereas Dima would have been more. We can see that Anabira found fault with almost each of Hassan's choice of words. Such was the high literary standard at the time. When it comes to the Quran, many accounts show that Arabia's finest poets, some of whom were public opponents of Islam, were mesmerized by its eloquence. 
As increasing numbers of converts to Islam held the Quran up as a tangible miracle of Arabic literature, sworn opponents of the faith, despite their every attempt to dismiss it, were unable to meet the Quran's challenge to produce a chapter like it. And if you are in doubt about what we have sent down upon our servant Muhammad, then produce a chapter the like thereof. Yes. If the author of the Quran had been a human being, then logically other human beings of a similar or greater literary capability would have been able to produce something on the level of the Quran. This would be actually really interesting to research and see if there have been people successful at creating something similar to the Quran. Over 1,400 years, none have been able to meet its challenge. The Quran makes its origin loud and clear. Your companion Muhammad is neither astray nor being misled nor does he say anything of his own desire. It is no less than inspiration sent down to him. He was taught by one mighty in power. All right, guys, and this is it for today's video. Long enough as it is, I'm going to cut it off here. Absolutely beautifully done. Yet again, those videos really take sophistication. I have to say that I agree with most of it, but a few points didn't really convey it to me. For example, the part with the name Yahya and Johannan wasn't so impressive to me, but nevertheless, I don't want to discard the rest of the video, which indeed was very interesting and moreover made me want to learn Arabic. God willing, we will see what will happen, but I'm very fascinated by the Quran and it would be really amazing to understand Arabic and to be able to appreciate it in its totality. All right, guys, but this is it for today's video. If you liked it, leave it a thumbs up. If you haven't subscribed already, guys, please do so. And if you want to support me via Patreon, all the links are in the description box below. Thank you so much for that as well. As always, may God bless you all, guys. Much love and peace.